Um, so what I'm going to be talking today is uh, talking to you about is personal health visualization. And I'd like to start off with a little bit of a discussion about why personal health visualization? What makes it personal? And whenever we think about uh, clinical care, this is a, an image that I think we tend to associate. Uh, a patient going to the doctor and describing symptoms and then having the doctor interpret that data. Okay? This is the traditional model for clinical care. Uh, but a quick question, who here has a body? <laughs> this is a better test for who's paying attention, I think. <laughs> But we're not all clinical care providers, um, and we're also not all data scientists or data visualization people. So we need tools that help us to better understand uh, what it is that we need to pay attention to about our bodies to live healthier lives. And there's some disruptive technology that's really changing some of these traditional notions of healthcare. Uh, one of the biggest, I think, and, and most talked about is this kit, uh, 23andMe. Uh, so something that up until November, uh, you were actually easily uh, able to obtain over the internet without the intervention of a, of a clinical care provider for, for not that much money, uh, $100. Um, and you are able to obtain a lot of information about yourself that you would never have been able to find out about. But again, there are some risks and, and, and interesting um, challenges that come along with trying to understand data that's as complex as your body's data when you're trying to make decisions about your own personal health and well-being. So also, I'd like to talk about what is data visualization. I'm, I'm going to be talking a lot about it, so I'd like to make certain that we're kind of on the same page. So let's kind of start off by framing this as what is not data visualization. And, and many of you may disagree, but it'll help you understand the types of things that I'll be talking about for the rest of my um, presentation. So I tend not to mean these. Uh, infographics, uh, very useful, but static representations that you find on websites and magazines and blogs that can be useful to understand the connections between types of wines. Uh, if you want to know about octopi, I think is the plural of that, on World Octopus Day, you can find out things there or how soda impacts your health. But these aren't really data visualizations. Um, what I mean, though, is the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations of data that help you amplify cognition. And the key here is the word interactive, things that allow you to actually manipulate and explore your data, not static representations that tell you only one aspect of that information. And whenever I say amplify cognition, I, I mean trying to help you make better decisions, giving you things to externalize information and remember things that you wouldn't be able to otherwise, or, or find new insights that you wouldn't have been able to without the tools available. Okay. So here's an example. Can everybody see the saturation is a little bit light? But here's an example of what I would say is an interactive data visualization that can be used to explore health data. So this is an example from uh, GE. Uh, they're actually um, collecting about 7.2 million patient records in a proprietary, unfortunately, database. Uh, but you can explore this by going to the website. And what they've done is try to highlight the instances where more than one disease was present in each patient record to explore how comorbidity exists across the entire database. So if you were to click on something like high blood cholesterol, you can see that diabetes type 2, uh, surprisingly, is you know, highly comorbid with that disease. And we can see that color is also used to group things together. And then the number of instances of each uh, condition is, is mapped to the size. Uh, so we can see that there's actually quite a lot of high blood cholesterol in the patient. Uh, profiles of these records. But as it's interactive, if we were more interested in, say, sore throat or upper respiratory tract infection, we can work through the data to explore what's important to us. Okay. Here's another uh, more, more complex uh, example, and this is uh, from the University of Washington. Um, and what we're looking at here is the global burden of, uh, of disease. And so this is a, a visualization that's known as a tree map. It's a good way of exploring the number of cases that exist in categories and subcategories of data. So if we look on the left, we see this massive blue wedge. If, if you think about like cutting brownies into smaller and smaller pieces, that's, that's kind of how this visualization works. So blue is non-communicable diseases, things like lung disease and liver disease. Red are communicable diseases like uh, HIV and malaria. And in the upper right, we have um, injuries, things like road injuries and accidents or fire. 
And so there's some things that we're able to do with a system like this that it's actually very difficult to do with numbers. So if we wanted to compare, say, lung disease to liver disease, it's, it's very easy to get a sense for the area difference between those and see that there's actually more cases for lung than liver disease. But it also lets us see that there's a, there's a much larger number of communicable diseases worldwide than there are non-communicable, uh, I'm sorry, non-communicable diseases in blue to uh, communicable diseases in red. Um, communicable is one of those words that's fun to say over and over and over again. Um, and so this is also um, being represented. Uh, when you see the size of these, what do I mean by the global burden of disease? These are actually represented in the um, disease-adjusted life years. So if you think about from the onset of a disease to the point of death, you take those years, and then you also consider the difference between the, the point of death and the expected date of death for a healthy individual. And that gives you the, the effect of that disease on the years of life of that person. So this gives us a way of understanding how much each disease is affecting the entire world. And there are controls that let us explore this in a lot of other ways. Okay. So we've talked about what data visualization is and is not, but let's focus on what is it good for. Um, so one of the things that data visu visualization is really good for is presenting information or telling a story to someone else, or at least I hope it is, because that's what I'm doing. Uh, so this is Gapminder. Uh, so Gapminder is a, a really great example of a tool that actually lets you analyze historical health trends, right? So if you wanted to see, um, let's say, so this representation is a, is a fairly familiar scatter plot. Along the y-axis, we have health or life expectancy at birth. Uh, along the bottom, we have money, uh, so GDP per person. And then each of the bubbles is a different country, and the size is the population for that country. And Gapminder gives us a really good understanding of how each of those countries has changed over the last 100 years. So you can see many countries entering the developed world um, and moving along the top right. And then you can see the effects of things like World, world, uh, world War II changing some of the countries that were involved and sliding them back not only along GDP but also along health. And then rebounding as their economies uh, come back. It's, it's an excellent uh, tool, and I encourage all of you, uh, look up Gapminder if you get a chance after this. Hans Reisling, the, the primary researcher for Gapminder, does, does just a great uh, exploration of this data. And you can, you can go to the site and play with it also. It's really neat. Um, so another thing health visu uh, uh, data visualization is good for is finding aspects of the data that are actually really hard to detect if you just look at the summary statistics. So this is a, a great example. This is called Anscombe's Quartet. And if we were to look at the summary statistics for these, the surprising thing is that they all have the exact same mean variance and linear regression, right? But if we look, the upper left-hand corner has an x and y plot that, I, I mean, we, we might expect to find that linear regression for. There's clearly a relationship as x increases, y increases. Um, if we look at the bottom left, though, we can see that there's this massive outlier that's completely throwing off the linear regression. And if we were to just look at the data values printed out by uh, a text-based analysis only, we completely miss that the linear regression is, complete, is thrown off by that outlier. The, the upper right, there's not even a linear relationship. There's something much more strange and unique going on with a curving uh, expression between x and y. And then in the bottom right, there's, there's no real linear relationship whatsoever. There's just a, an outlier that's throwing off the vertical uh, pattern there. So data visualization is really good for detecting these things that uh, just raw analysis doesn't really tell us. Data visualization is also good for analyzing data when you don't know what you're looking for. So this massive, horribly ugly uh, <laughs> spreadsheet is, is actually representative of a lot of the types of crimes and accident reports in, in Atlanta. And if we were presented with this information, it might be very difficult to figure out exactly what we wanted to learn about it. Uh, we might want to, say, explore temporal trends. So like, is crime increasing or is crime decreasing? And we could start sorting through and maybe running some tests. But it's, it's difficult to know what we want to do until we actually have a goal. So one of the things that data visualization is good for is helping us find insights that we might not be able to find otherwise, just in text-based analysis. So this is, this is the same data, crime in Atlanta. And we can see that there are very clear uh, seasonal trends where crime dips down every winter and then goes back up in the summer as the heat rises. So what about personal health data, right? So 
There are a lot of types of personal health data. So this is another representation for hospitals, actually, uh, 17,000 healthcare organizations across the country. And what we see are representations for different types of measures, for things they're doing well and things that they're not doing well. And why I present this as an example of personal health visualization is because this is a, a trying to make an informed personal choice. So if I really am looking for an area that, that does well in surgery, I might want to look for something that has consistently performed well in surgery. So I might be looking for things that are rated in light greens or dark greens across the top row. So in each successive measure, they've done really well. So we can see uh, Hutchison Med Medical Center in Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia, uh, has done fairly well, as has DeKalb Medical at North Decatur. But if we're looking for something like, um, say, heart attack, uh, we can see that Graydon Memorial is actually pretty consistently uh, well ranked in that, in that trend. And as I said, it's 17,000, and you can, you can see a few different types of representations. This is a, another GE visualization, um, just selected for some of the Georgia area medical treatment centers. Okay. And so I'd like to return to some of the questions that Greg brought up. So personal genomic data. Again, you're trying to explore and better understand how personal health and personal genomic data can help you make decisions. So one of the, one of the um, first questions is, where did I come from? Uh, what types of conditions and diseases do people like me have? Uh, disease, if you have a rare condition or a serious condition, what can you do about it? Uh, wellness, can you live longer or can you live better for that time? And also prediction, and this is a, the, the most nettlesome one. Will my child be born with a defect, or will I develop a disease at some point in the future? Okay. So when we think of ancestry, one of the first things that we think of is the family tree. So here we have a network diagram of thousands of related genetic profiles, all connected by a, a, an ancestral relationship. We can, it's actually hard to tell at this resolution, but there are tiny little arrows uh, connecting all of them. Right? But if we expand this with additional information, say by, by coloring the links or by, by certain types of conditions or expanding the size, thank you. Expanding the size, does this actually work? It does, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> or, or expanding the size of the nodes or changing the layout. We can find out more information than just um, who am I related to, but what does that information mean? Um, how far am I away from the people with this benefit or how close am I to people with some sort of condition? Um, patients like me is a very interesting one, and one that I would also uh, describe as a fairly disruptive technology. So this is a site where you can log on and search for people who have a similar condition to you. And they actually have a, a wide variety of data visualizations and charts at their disposal. Um, it's difficult to explore unless you actually label yourself as having a disease, but uh, do try and check it out if you can. So if you're looking for people who, say, have a similar age to you, uh, or who are the same gender as you, who are suffering from a disease, uh, such as multiple uh, sclerosis, you can find people who are suffering from that disease, and they'll self-report what their experience has been. And this is really interesting because you're not just reading about possibilities of diagnosis, right? You're actually reaching out to people who are reporting what their individual experience has been. And then we have in the middle um, severity ratings for different types of symptoms. So you can find out, am I just the only one in the world who has a lot of trouble with brain fog, or are there actually a lot of people who do that as well? Um, and then at the bottom, and, and this is, uh, I think, uh, really interesting as well, perceived effectiveness of the different types of treatments. So not just is your experience like mine, but also based upon your treatment, how did that go? And is it going to work for me? Now, that's a difficult question to answer, but you can at least reach out to people who have had a similar experience to you and begin to understand um, whether or not um, you know, their treatment options have had any success. Or maybe if you need to look for alternative treatments to talk over with your clinical care provider. Okay. Um, so one of the, I think, most difficult aspects of any data set, but particularly health data set as health data sets as they relate to you, is the notion of uncertainty. So as you're trying to make decisions about what to do with your healthcare data, there can be a lot of um, difficulty depending on certain aspects of the data beyond just the raw values presented. So um, a good example is, I guess, back for the, uh, the multiple sclerosis patient, how recently was this information acquired, right? Um, was it two weeks ago and everybody has had roughly the same um, 
types of care that are available to me, they've had all the benefits of the most modern developments, or is it two to three years old, or is it five years old? Like how, how useful is this information? Okay. And also for reported results, we were talking earlier about um, the life years and how diseases can affect that. So each of these bars actually represents different reports worldwide for certain types of diseases. And we have this, this very thin red line that actually represents diabetes. Where there's a difference in reported uh, worldwide life years between 40 million and 55 million, which is, which is a lot of difference, um, but it is one of the more highly ranked diseases. What's more interesting is this one over here. It's, it's ranked much lower, but we can see that there's actually a difference in life years ranging from zero to uh, almost 35, 40 million days. Uh, that's whoop, uh, whooping cough. Um, one that we might not think about as being a, a, a major pervasive threat, but depending on where you're obtaining that data from, it can actually be a, a fairly burdensome disease. Some of the other ones uh, up at the top um, uh, have a fairly known and limited scope as well. But, Understanding this type of uncertainty is, is challenging, even for people who know a lot about the information. And visualization can help make some of this information a little bit more clear. And then there's also a question of, once you have access to your genomic or health-based data, what do you do with it, right? So one aspect that we, we talked about earlier was changing your behavior or, or setting goals to meet over time. And uh, this is just one example, RunKeeper, but it's, it's a good one, I think where you can actually start to track your data over time. Now, there's a, a massive movement of, of people who are recording this type of information about themselves long term and trying to understand how the decisions that they make and the exercise plans that they put in place for themselves lead to results, right? So um, one of the things that I think is important about this is that it actually gives you a way of reflecting on whether or not a particular treatment or a particular course of action has been beneficial to you. Um, so one of the last examples that I'd like to talk about, um, 23andMe, and this is, this is a fairly uh, difficult, and, and Greg talked about a lot of the aspects of this that are, are challenging, um, but prediction is, is a very difficult um, aspect. And again, uncertainty plays a, a large role in this. Um, we're able to predict some things fairly well, other things not so well. Some of the Mendelian inherited disorders like uh, cystic fibrosis, for example, we, we have a pretty good understanding of whether or not that's going to be inherited by your children. Other things are, are much more challenging. So whenever a system presents four stars of confidence, what does that mean? <laughs> What is five stars? What is one star? And, and that can be, I think, part of the reason that people struggle with systems like this is trying to understand exactly what their data is telling them, but not having a lot of help uh, understanding what it actually means and how applicable the presented results are for them. And uh, this is one of the things that, that Greg and I are, are, are trying to explore long term. But um, uh, so if you, if you have your 23andMe data or if you have other genetic data and you'd like to talk to us more about it, we'd, we'd certainly love to do that.